offshore wind, solar. Dominion Energy is a leader in the clean energy transition. We're dedicated to providing reliable, affordable, safe, and clean energy as we support and invest in our communities in 16 states. Dominion Energy is building a clean energy future. Actions speak louder. Welcome to Action Speak Louder. Today you'll hear about a wonderful community organization that we at Dominion Energy are proud to support. I'm Peggy Fox, Dominion Energy's Media and Community Relations Manager in Northern Virginia. My guest is Kelly Garrity, and she is the Executive Director of the Jennifer Bush Lawson Foundation. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Peggy. We're glad to be here, too. Well, tell us about the organization. What does the Jennifer Bush Lawson Foundation do? Wonderful. And I'm going to shorten it because it is Good. a mouthful. <laughs> we go by JBLF for short. We were started in 2014 with a mission to focus on low income moms and babies in our area, mm -hmm. primarily looking at access to affordable care that meets their needs and materials to make sure they can bring baby home safely. It's named after Jennifer Bush Lawson. Tell us who she was. Sure. And I'll share something. I'm the first person in our inner circle that actually did not know Jennifer or the family personally. She was an amazing mom to three. All three babies had NICU stays. Mm -hmm. And after their experience having amazing health care, not having to worry about missing work or anything to do with her pregnancy, she really thought about those less fortunate than her and had been talking about wanting to give back to that community. Her background in PR made her a very natural marketer of this idea, and she was starting to get those ideas behind her when she unfortunately lost her life. And it, I remember I was a news reporter uh, when she lost her life in a, a tragic accident uh, and how horrific that was. And then I learned later about the start of this organization. Yeah. Tell us about how the organization started. Sure. You know, it, it, I've got my own grief experience, so mm. I can speak from mm. that. And action through grief is something that is a huge part of the healing process. We held a 5K six months after the accident, which mm -hmm. if you can imagine, Neil Lawson, her husband, is there with three very young kids and six months later immediately starts to give back to the community. Mm -hmm. Our 5K is coming into its seventh year now. And not only that, we use it as a springboard for our other programmatic activities. Mm -hmm. it, it, uh, I, I remember being just amazed, you know, that this had grown. And in fact, I had to, had to like think, wait a minute, I know that name. I remember that, that name and then realized that they had, uh, you know, her husband and friends had started this um, organization. Uh, you know, when you think about the, the people that this organization helps, uh, low-income women, uh, women of color, underserved communities, um, the odds are really stacked up against this community, uh, especially uh, in terms of prenatal care and, and things like that. Talk about some of the, um, the problems they face in uh, going to get their health care uh, when they're pregnant. What are some of the hurdles? Sure. You know, one of the things is just finding out in a timely manner they are pregnant. Many of these populations You've got immigration issues that they have concern about with accessing healthcare in general, but you also have a fear of the institution of healthcare itself, no matter what the background is. You know, you look at the African American community, for example, yeah. and there's a very long standing fear of healthcare. With research, we know access to prenatal care in the first trimester is key. So, increasing access for these women has been part of our seven year history. Mm -hmm. Many of these women have to take off multiple hours of work to get to an appointment. Mm -hmm. I've heard our constituents say, I had to choose care or my job mm. and feeding my family. No one should be put in that position. Yeah, it's, uh, it's terrible to have to be put in that position when you have a, a, a nine to five job or whatever hour yeah. job and you can't make it and you aren't being given the time off uh, yeah. to go get health care. Do you ever intervene with or, or try to contact an employer? We don't intervene with mm. the employers, but what we have done is put a focused effort on innovative pilot projects that will bring the care to them. One of the things that we funded a few years ago was a telemedicine pilot. Mm. Now, after last year, 
Everyone's used to telemed. Yeah. No, no one questions seeing a doctor on their phone anymore. Right. But in 2017, with this population in particular, you wouldn't have thunk mm. that it would be transformative. These women could take their doctor's appointments from their car, from the closet of the house that they're cleaning, and in 15 minutes have an appointment instead of hours mm. and get the ongoing care they needed. The results were so impactful mm -hmm. that Virginia Hospital Center took over the program completely the following year. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. And it is so interesting that we all have been enlightened. I've had a, uh, a telehealth <laughs> appointment, you know? I think probably most people have now, having gone through the pandemic. And I think many people now understand and they realize you can gain information, you know, not, the things that doctors can see and touch in person or take blood or things like that. But there's so much doctors can learn by questions and really looking too through the screen. Don't yeah. you think? There is, and we've seen the personal connection increase too with the comfort level of those patients with the care they're receiving. Mm. When you're comfortable with the care you're receiving, you're more likely to say, well, I have a niggle here, or I feel short of breath here, and the doctors can say, that's not normal. Let's check it out. Mm -hmm. Most people going into a doctor's office, they go completely blank. If they had questions mm -hmm. beforehand, they're going to forget it. But it, when you're more comfortable, you're going to remember those things you wanted to bring up. Well, I'm glad you told me that, because now I don't feel so bad about forgetting to tell the doctor something, yeah. you know? You go to the doctor and you, oh, I'm fine, you know, you forget all your lists. So yeah, the important. five things you thought about right before <laughs> they entered the door, out of the brain. Have you found that the women you serve are very comfortable now with telehealth um, appointments? They are, and what it has done is increase the comfort level with their care providers, mm -hmm. too. Being in a comfortable environment, they're much more likely to mention, I have a niggle or I'm short of breath walking just a block, which to most doctors say, this isn't normal, let's check it out more. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we've seen is adherence to appointments has increased. When you have high blood pressure as a pregnant woman, for example, you could have to take your blood pressure twice a week in a doctor's office. You may not see the doctor, you just have to go in, take it, put the cuff on, five minute appointment and you're done. Well, by providing them with home blood pressure cuffs, they take hours out of their day to just do it at home. We've seen that increase in the care that they've received and their back and forth with their doctor. Well, now I'd like to share a video with you. Jennifer's husband, Neil Lawson, put his heart and soul into helping start this organization. Here's a short video from Neil. Jennifer Lawson had three complicated pregnancies. Fortunately, she had access to healthcare and doctors that were able to help her navigate the challenges that she and our unborn children faced. Unfortunately, in the United States, there is an underserved population of women that are economically vulnerable and receive a different class of care, if any care at all. In the foundation's efforts, we're trying to remove barriers to that care by helping to provide transportation, making a telemedicine program available so that they can have the same assistance and preventative attention that Jen and many other mothers in the area have had. So Neil has his hands full with these three kids to raise, but you know, it seems like he's become good friends with, with her friends who helped start this organization. How did that all play out? Well, you know, it, it's again going back to something out of a tragic loss. Mm -hmm. it, no one expected what happened to Jen to happen. And it wasn't just those who know her who came out. You know, the entire Nottingham Elementary community mm -hmm. has always stepped up year after year just because her kids went there. So the foundation has become very much a part of the community, not just who Neil or Jen knew as they were a couple in growing their kids. It's been an amazing mm -hmm. transformation. And it really does say a lot about her friends. Yeah. That yeah. they would, you know, it's not just, oh, let's do this. It's they, they are committed and year after year committed. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's, we're going on seven years now, mm -hmm. which it, most people forget about mm -hmm. those they've lost seven years in. And we have this continued commitment from those who knew her or knew of her, knew about the tragedy, might have heard about it on the news, and they come out year after year to support mm -hmm. us. 
So the Jennifer Bush Lawson Foundation's mission statement says that the organization aims to honor her dedication, that's Jennifer's dedication, generosity, and kind heart by fulfilling the vision that she crafted for every mother and baby in need. Uh, do you think this is an organization she would have started or was planning to start? It is. Mm -hmm. She had a lot of conversations with Neil about what the giving back looked like and how she could shape and help the moms in need in our area. Mm -hmm. She actually was a runner herself, so the 5K was born out of that passion for running that mm -hmm. she had, and as a way to start that community feel to help give back right. to those low-income moms. I, and we'll, we'll be talking a little later in the show about uh, the 5K, because that's your big fundraiser, and it's one that Dominion Energy is supporting, yeah. and we've supported in the past. But um, let's, let's continue to talk more about about the mission and the work with the community because Jen saw this tremendous need yeah. and um, you know and everybody else uh, realized that too Virginia Hospital is now how does Virginia Hospital work with JBLF they're an amazing partner and we work very closely with their outpatient clinic. Mm -hmm. Their outpatient clinic is the equivalent of uh, the low income clinic for all Arlingtonians, regardless of immigration status. So many get care at the free clinic, which you guys may know about, but the Arlington VHC clinic has low income patients as well and they see everything under the sun. Their OB days in particular through COVID have seen a 30% increase in the number of pregnant women that are coming through, which tells you just how much more work we have on our plate. How did JBL handle uh, COVID? Well, we did some innovative things. We did one program that we have since sunsetted that Dominion did actually help sponsor, which was our Feeding Families Initiative. Mm -hmm. We wanted to make sure that any mom who had a baby or was getting ready to have a baby for a few weeks post or pre or post delivery had home cooked meals twice a week for her and her family. We delivered more than 3,000 hot cooked, all you had to do is maybe reheat meals throughout COVID. And then we started our baby bundle program because we wanted to make sure that they had the bare minimum needed to bring baby home safely, a car seat, mm. a crib or a portable crib, and breastfeeding supplies. Mm -hmm. These moms never had that. We heard of moms who had their babies in dresser drawers oh, or sleeping gosh. with them, which has yeah. done safely issues, but you know, if you've got five people to a bed, it dangers the child. Yeah. So we wanted to make sure they had that bare minimum. And that program continues today. Wow. You know, um, I would also like to play this video we have of a nurse because you talk about Virginia Hospital Center and the, and the partnership there, but it's, it's the people who work there who are dealing directly with your patients. So um, the Jennifer Bush Lawson Foundation is touching doctors and nurses as well, and they see firsthand its impact. Please watch this short video from a nurse describing what she's seen. As a nurse, I think that it's been really cool to see patients that otherwise wouldn't have been able to participate in their OB care, wouldn't have been able to make it to their routine prenatal visits that um, they're now able to come to. They, they haven't had to miss work, they haven't had to find childcare that is otherwise expensive. Um, they've been able to do these things from home or from their car. And so being able to create um, healthier, um, safer pregnancies is a really cool thing to be part of. It is very meaningful to hear from somebody on the front lines to see the discrepancies in, in health care and access. Um, so, so Kelly, you know, how, how beneficial has it been for you to see nurses on board and doctors and people who work at Virginia Hospital Center to, uh, you know, to partner with the Jennifer Bush Lawson Foundation? Well, you know, it's been a great symbiotic relationship mm -hmm. because we never set out to need to have a direct contact with the mom we set out to make sure they could bring their baby home safely mm -hmm. and they had access to care that met their needs. The partnership with Virginia Hospital Center has allowed us to do just that. Mm -hmm. We've also allowed them to push their thinking in the innovative programs that they've done, like telemedicine. We've also helped them pilot OB Connect, which is a follow-on to telemedicine that's more comprehensive. Each one of these patients has a nurse that is their point of contact, no matter which doctor, no matter which resident, no matter who they see in the office, 
They have one person they can go to with any questions possible. Mm -hmm. As you can imagine, that's transforming how they feel about the care they receive. We already know there's been more than one instance of those moms, especially postpartum, mm -hmm. reaching out to the nurse saying, I'm not okay. I don't know where to go to get services that I need, but mm -hmm. I know I'm not okay. Mm -hmm. Can you help? And they have. Like postpartum depression yeah. you're speaking about there, which can be yeah. very uh, difficult and yeah. you know, even, even um, deadly. And even you know, breastfeeding support. Ugh, with with yeah. the best of support, mm -hmm. it can still be a struggle. And for these families, they yep. don't know where to go. And that's been another way that they've been able to help. Mm -hmm. In my family, I have a, an in-law who just this past week had a baby at Virginia Hospital Center. And it's been a very uh, wonderful experience and yeah. the, the care that they've received. So it's, it's wonderful to know that care is, that kind of care is expanding out to low-income communities who often don't have it. And, it, you know, if you could touch a little bit on why they don't have it, because maybe people don't realize, well, if they have health care, if they have the Affordable Care Act, if they have, well, you know, why don't they have, uh, wh what's different about uh, somebody from a low-income community uh, who doesn't have the same ac access? Why don't they have the access? Health care access is huge. You know, mm -hmm. even with insurance, it can be so expensive that your out-of-pocket costs eat up your budget every month. I've seen this with multiple friends where mm. they've had to go low-income routes because their insurance was too expensive. Mm. Their mm. out-of-pocket costs per year, if you have asthma, could be $26,000. Even for a middle-income family, that's gonna cut you at your knees. For many of these families, they are working hourly jobs. Mm -hmm. They're not salaried. Every part of that paycheck goes to pay for some other piece of living here in this area, this very expensive area. And on average, a family of four to qualify for many of the county and state services is $53,000 a year mm. that they're living on for a family of four, which most other places is a lot, but not here. Yeah, no, that doesn't go very far no. here in this area. No. Um, you know, and I think what, wouldn't it be nice if we didn't have to have an organization like yours? Yeah. And I don't know if that, you know, if you do any sort of advocating on. We on do. In fact, one of the things we're going to start in the new year is a research project directly with this patient population. We want to tackle a couple of things. One, we want to learn how they're being communicated with as they seek care where they're looking to find the care that they do receive, whether it's from a church, from a community group, from a mom who might have delivered five years ago and had an adverse relationship with the care she received. Mm -hmm. And then those who have access to care, what could we do better? How could we meet your needs better? Mm -hmm. And we're gonna use that research to look at systemic change. And maybe use it to advocate at the state level or federal level? We're going to start locally. And <laughs> Local we'll level? <laughs> start with Arlington County. Ar <laughs> there, are, there are some on the Arlington board who have been very um, interested mm -hmm. in learning more about this and how they can help and what mm -hmm. ways we can look at doing this. But Virginia State has actually been really above and beyond what other states have done in Medicaid expansion mm -hmm. and Medicare expansion yes. and looking at the immigration um, population in particular and how do we remove barriers mm -hmm. to get better outcomes. And this country is so different from other uh, civilized countries in terms of health care. It is. What have you learned there? I think everything is a balance of risk mm -hmm. and risk tolerance. And costs, and, yeah. Yeah, you mm -hmm. know, socialized medicine or single payer systems, they have a lot of risk mitigation mm. that comes with it. Mm -hmm. If you need an elective procedure, you might have to wait two years. Whereas with the US system, you know, you could walk into your plastic surgeon tomorrow and have your insurance pay for it. One of the biggest things with this population is they end up using the ER as their default mm -hmm. doctor. Very expensive. If we can solve for that mm -hmm. in how they access better basic care, you mitigate the cost to the system and have overall better outcomes. We look back to that telemedicine pilot that we did, we reduced ER admissions by more than 60%. Wow. That alone could pay for a program. Were you able to find the data, how much that saved? She's not gonna say. <laughs> 
<laughs> but you know that you know that's the way to make changes is compiling exactly. data. You've got to have the data. Yeah. You've got to have the facts exactly. and the numbers uh, in order to move the needle and make any changes. Um, yeah. So how many how many women and babies do you all serve? So we have done more than 300 a year. Mm -hmm. It has been going up since COVID. So we have lofty goals mm -hmm. of wanting to make sure that we can meet that increased demand. You know, every mother who delivers a baby has to have a car seat to bring their baby yeah. home. That's something where we can step in. We work with moms groups and get gently used car seats that mm -hmm. we can pass forward to these moms. Where do they get them otherwise? Where were they getting them before you all came into the picture? Virginia State has a program that I helps so. to provide them, but because of COVID, oh. it has been shuttered and has not restarted. So, we're, I know. <laughs> what? Staff, oh, yeah. cost, it's time. So, so many crazy changes have happened during COVID, yeah. you know. We, you, 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 you're walking down the street, well, where did that business go? Where, you know, very, it just yeah. uh, very tumultuous time for people. It, it and, is. You know, it and is. then, of course, um, you know, we lost many, many people. We did. We did, yeah. But um, you guys are still plugging along. And uh, tell me what you, you, you said, uh, most of the women, are all the women that you help uh, from Arlington County? There is a transientness to this area, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. If you look at Northern Virginia, they might live in Arlington one year, in Alexandria the next, mm -hmm. in Falls Church mm -hmm. City the next, in Fairfax County the next. So you see that churn in this area as they seek out better living arrangements or mm -hmm. end up having family move in that they can you know, co-house share with. So there is a transient nature to this patient population. Mm -hmm. And do you have a set number? I mean, you can't take everybody. Or no, you do. You take everybody who comes we, and knocks we, on your door. We try to <laughs> serve as many as we can. Uh, it, you know, it, in COVID, we said, let's see what we can do. Mm -hmm. And this year, we've been able to increase it. Next year, we'll aim to do the same. Our ultimate goal, though, is by doing this research, by looking at what their needs are, we get to a point where we don't have to do anything. And mm -hmm. then, you know, we'll have done our mission. Then, yeah, mission complete. Exactly. Let's hope. But uh, what wonderful groundwork you're doing and, and help for all these women and babies. I mean, that's the goal, yeah. to make sure that these babies are healthy. And as we all know, it helps to have prenatal care it tremendously. Does. It does. It helps with infant mortality. It helps mm -hmm. with SIDS. It helps with mom's health. You know, the more that you can catch things early on, the better the outcomes mm -hmm. are. Well, you've got a big fundraiser coming up. And so I, uh, I would like to, we're going to take a little break right now. And when we come back, we're going to hear all about this exciting fundraiser coming up later in November. Stay tuned.
Tell us about your fundraiser coming up. I'm happy to. And it's not just a fundraiser, it's for the family. So we have a 5K on a very hilly course. The course record is not as fast as you would think. And then we have a fun day that follows with moon bounces and petting zoo, face painting, balloon animals, laser tag, a beer garden for the parents, a live local band generally. And it's really a day for the whole family. Fun this year, Neil and I will be getting pied in the face by the top fundraiser and top team. All right, and it's November 20th, right? Correct, at where 9 a.m. Where do we go to sign up? jb-lf.org. Thank you so much, Kelly. We really appreciate it. Thank you. And all the great work you're doing. Thanks for watching Action Speak Louder.